Chapter Three of Tourmalin's Time Checks. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anna Simon. Tourmalin's Time Checks by Thomas Anstey Guthrie. Chapter Three, the Third Check. As the reader may imagine, this second experience had an effect upon Peter that was rather deterrent than encouraging. It was a painful piece of self-revelation to find that, had he chosen to avail himself of the extra hours on board the boomerang as they occurred, he would have so employed them as to place himself in relations of considerable ambiguity toward two distinct young ladies. How far he was committed to either, or both, he could not tell but he had an uneasy suspicion that neither of them would have been quite so emotional had he conducted himself with the same prudence that had marked his behaviour throughout the time which he was able to account for. And yet his conscience acquitted him of any actual default. If he had ever really had any passages at all approaching the sentimental with either Miss Tyrrell or Miss Davenport, his mind could hardly be so utterly blank on the subject as it certainly was. No. At the worst, his failings were only potential peccadilloes, the kind of weaknesses he might have given way to if he had not wisely postponed the hours in which the occasions were afforded. He had had a warning, a practical moral lesson, which had merely arrived, as such things often do, rather after date. But, so far as it was possible to profit by it, he would. At least, he would abstain from making any further inroads upon the balance of extra time which still remained to his credit at the bank. He would draw no further cheques. He would return to that P&O steamer no more. For an engaged man, whose wedding day was approaching by leaps and bounds, it was, however innocent, too disturbing and exciting a form of distraction to be quite safely indulged in. The resolution cost him something, nevertheless. Peter was not a man who had hitherto been spoiled by feminine adoration. Sophia was fond of him, but she never affected to place him upon any sort of pinnacle. On the contrary, she looked down upon him, protectingly and indulgently, from a moral and intellectual pedestal of her own. He had not objected to this. In fact, he rather liked it. But it was less gratifying and stimulating to his self-esteem than the romantic and idealizing sentiments which he had seemingly inspired in two exceedingly bewitching young persons with whom he felt so much in sympathy. It was an agreeable return from the bread and butter of engaged life to the petit four of semi-flirtation. After all, Peter was but human, and a man is seldom esteemed for being otherwise. He could not help a natural regret at having to abandon experiences which, judging from the fragmentary samples he had obtained, promised so much and such varied interest. That the interest was not consecutive only made it the more amusing. It was a living puzzle-picture, the pieces of which he could fit together as he received them. It was tantalizing to look at his cheque-book, and feel that upon its leaves the rest of the story was written, but that he must never seek to decipher it. It became so tantalizing that he locked the cheque-book up at last. But already some of the edge had worn off his resolution, and he had begun to see only the more seductive side of the interviews, which at the time had not been free from difficulty and embarrassment. Having put himself beyond the reach of temptation, he naturally began to cast about for some excuse for again exposing himself to it. It was the eve of his wedding day. He was in his chambers for the last time, and alone, for he would not see Sophia again until he met her in bridal array at the church door, and he had no bachelor friends whom he cared to invite to help him to keep up his spirits. Peter was horribly restless and nervous. He needed a sedative of some kind, and even trying on his wedding garments failed to soothe him as he felt almost certain there was a wrinkle between the shoulders, and it was too late to have it altered. The idea of one more visit to the boomerang, one more interview, the last, with one or other of his amiable and fascinating friends, it did not matter very much which, presented itself in a more and more attractive light. If it did nothing else, it would provide him with something to think about for the rest of the evening. Was it courteous? Was it even right? to drop his friends without the slightest apology or explanation? Ought he not, as a gentleman and a man of honour, to go back and bid them good-bye? Peter, after carefully considering the point, discovered that it was clearly his duty to perform this trifling act of civility. 
As soon as he had settled that, he got out his cheque-book from the dispatch-box, in which he had placed it for his own security, and, sitting down just as he was, drew another fifteen minutes, and cashed them, like the first, at the Ormolu clock. This time he found himself sitting on a cushioned bench in the music-room of the boomerang. It was shortly after sunset, as he could tell from the bar of dusky crimson against the violet sea, which, framed in the ports opposite, rose and sank with each roll of the ship. There was a swell on, and she rolled more than he could have wished. As he expected, he was not alone, but, as he had not expected, his companion was neither Miss Tyrell nor Miss Davenport, but a grim and portly matron, who was eyeing him with a look of strong disfavour, which made Peter wish he had not come. What, he wondered, was he in for now? His uneasiness was increased as he glanced down upon his trousers, which, being new and of a delicate lavender tint, reminded him that in his impatience he had come away in his wedding garments. He feared that he must present rather an odd appearance on board ship in this festal attire. But there he would have to stay for the next quarter of an hour, and he must make the best of it. "'I repeat, Mr. Tourmalin,' said the matron, "'you are doubtless not unprepared for the fact that I have requested a few minutes' private conversation with you.' "'Pardon me,' said Peter, quaking already at this alarming opening, "'but I am very much unprepared.' "'Surely,' he thought, "'this could not be another dear friend. "'No, that was too absurd. "'He must have drawn a line somewhere.' "'Then permit me to enlighten you,' she said raspingly. "'I sent for you at a time when we are least likely to be interrupted, "'to demand an explanation from you upon a very delicate and painful matter "'which has recently come to my knowledge.' "'Oh,' said Peter, and nothing more. "'He guessed her purpose at once. "'She was going to ask him his intentions with regard to her daughter. "'He could have wished for some indication as to whether she was Lady Tyrell or Mrs. Davenport, "'but as he had none at present.' Oh, seemed the safest remark to make. "'Life on board a large passenger ship, Mr. Tourmalin,' she went on to observe, "'though relaxed in some respects, is still not without decencies, which a gentleman is bound to respect.' "'Quite so,' said Peter, unable to discover the bearings which lay in the application of this particular observation. "'You say, quite so, but what has your behaviour been, sir?' "'That,' said Peter, is exactly what I should like to know myself. A true gentleman would have considered the responsibility he incurred by giving currency to idle and malicious gossip. His apprehensions were correct, then. It was one of the young lady's mothers. But which? I can only assure you, madam, he began, that if unhappily I have, um, been the means of furnishing gossip, it has been entirely unintentional. She seemed so much mollified by this that he proceeded with more confidence. As to anything I may have said to your daughter, when she almost bounded from her seat with fury. My daughter, sir, do you mean to sit there and tell me that you had the audacity to so much as hint of such a thing to my daughter, of all people? So, so much depends on who your daughter is, said Peter, completely losing his head. "'You dared to strike this cruel and unmanly blow at the self-respect of a sensitive girl, to poison her defenceless ears with your false, dastardly insinuations, and you can actually admit it?' "'I don't know whether I can admit it, or not yet,' he replied, "'and, and you do put things so very strongly. It is like this. If you are referring to any conversation I may have had with Miss Tyrell, "'Miss Tyrell! You have told her, too!' exclaimed this terrible old matron, thereby demonstrating that, at least, she was not Lady Tyrell. "'I—I I should have said Miss Davenport,' said Peter, correcting himself precipitately. "'Miss Davenport as well! Upon my word! And pray, sir, may I ask how many other ladies on board this ship are in possession of your amiable confidences?' He raised his hands in utter despair. "'I can't say,' he groaned. "'I don't really know what I may have said, or whom I may have said it to. I, I seem to have done so much in my spare time, but I never meant anything.' "'It may be so,' she said. "'Indeed, you hardly seem to me accountable for your actions, 
or you would not appear in such a ridiculous costume as that, with a sprig of orange blossom in your buttonhole, and a high hat, too. I quite feel, said Peter, blushing, that such a costume must strike you as inappropriate, but, but I happen to be trying them on, and, rather than keep you waiting. Well, well, sir, never mind your costume. The question is, if you are genuinely anxious to repair the wrong you have done, what course do you propose to take? I will be perfectly frank with you, madam, said Peter. I am not in a position to repair any wrong I have done, if I have done any wrong, which I don't admit, by taking any course whatever. You are not, she cried, and you tell me so to my face. After all, reflected Peter, why should he be afraid of this old lady? In a few more minutes he would be many hundreds of miles away, and he would take very good care not to come back again. He felt master of the situation, and determined to brazen it out. "'I do, madam,' he said, crossing his legs in an easy fashion. "'Look at it from a reasonable point of view. There is safety in numbers. And if I have been so unfortunate as to give several young ladies here an entirely erroneous impression, I must leave it to you to undeceive them as considerately but distinctly as you can. For me to make any selection would only create ill-feeling among the rest, and their own good sense will show them that I am forbidden by the laws of my country, which I am the last person to set at defiance, that I am forbidden, even if I were free in other respects, which I am not, to marry them all. "'The only possible explanation of your conduct is that you are not in your right mind,' she said. Who in the world spoke or dreamt of your marrying any one of them? Certainly not I. Oh, said Peter, hopelessly fogged once more. I thought I might unintentionally have given them grounds for some such expectation. I'm very glad I was mistaken. You see, you must really make allowances for my utter ignorance. If this idiotic behaviour is not a mere feint, sir, I can make allowances for much. But surely you are at least sufficiently in your proper senses to see how abominably you have behaved. Have I? said Peter, submissively. I don't wish to contradict you, if you say so, I'm sure. And, as I have some reason to believe that my stay on board this ship will not last very much longer, I should like, before I go, to express my very sincere regret. There is an easy way of proving your sincerity, sir if you choose to avail yourself of it, she said. I find it very difficult to believe, from the evident feebleness of your intellect, that you can be the person chiefly responsible for this scandal. Am I correct in my supposition? You are, madam, said Peter. I should never have got myself into such a tangle as this, if I had not been talked over by Mr. Perkins. I don't know if I can succeed in making myself clear, for the whole business is rather complicated, but I can try to explain it if you'll only have a little patience. "'You have said quite enough,' she said. "'I know all I wish to know now. So it was Mr. Perkins who has been using you as his instrument, was it?' "'Certainly,' said Peter. "'But for him nothing of this would have happened.' "'You will have no objection to repeating that statement, should I call upon you to do so?' "'No,' said Peter, who observed with pleasure that her wrath against himself was almost entirely moderated. "'But you will have to call soon, or I shall have gone. I—I I don't know if I shall have another opportunity of meeting Mr. Perkins, but if I did, I should suddenly tell him that I do not consider he has treated me quite fairly. He has put me in what I may call a false position, in several false positions, and if I had had the knowledge I have now, I should have had nothing to do with him from the first. He entirely misled me over this business.' "'Very well, sir.' she said. You have shown a more gentlemanly spirit, on the whole, than I expected. I am glad to find that your evil has been wrought more by want of thought than heart. It will be for you to complete your reparation when the proper time arrives. In the meantime, let this be a warning to you, sir, never to—' But here Peter made the sudden discovery that he was no longer in the music-room of the boomerang, but at home, in his old easy-chair by his bachelor fireside. Phew! he muttered to himself. That was a bad quarter of an hour while it lasted. What an old she-dragon it was! But she's right. It is a warning to me. I mustn't, I really must not draw any more of these confounded time-checks. 
I've made that ship too hot to hold me already. I'd better remain forever in contented ignorance of how I spent that extra time than to go on getting into one mess after another like this. It was a wonder I got out of this one as well as I did. But evidently that old woman knew what Perkins is, and saw I wasn't to blame. Now she'll explain the whole affair to all those girls, whoever they may be, and pitch into Perkins, and serve him right. I'm out of it, at any rate. And now, thank goodness, after to-morrow I shall have nothing to do but live contentedly and happily with dearest Sophia. I'd better burn this beastly cheque-book. I shall never want it again. It would have been well for Peter if he had burned that cheque-book, but when it came to the point he could not bring himself to destroy it. After all, it was an interesting souvenir of some very curious, if not unique, experiences, and, as such, he decided to preserve it. End of chapter 3